Hello, everyone. Welcome back. I am Jackson, as always, and we've got Enzo here. We also have Standing for Truth, and we're going to talk about uh, stuff and things, very likely. So uh, I will give the floor to him and let him talk. So, go ahead. Sorry, I heard, I heard an echo there. How are we doing, guys? Do I have any uh, uh, creationist friends in there? Probably not, I'm guessing. <laughs> In the chat area, we got uh, – all right, perfect, yeah. Um, I'm standing for truth. Um, I've seen some of your videos, Jackson. Um, you got some interesting stuff, so I think it should be a, um interesting conversation. Mm -hmm. Did you want me to kind of just present uh, where I'm coming from for a couple of minutes, and we'll just go back and forth there? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Okay. Um, I, I think it all comes down to – um, obviously the empirical evidence, um, you know, we're looking at the same evidence and, and what are we uh, inferring from there, right? Like in the biblical model, for example, um, you know, we do believe in change, obviously biological evolution means, you know, change in allele frequency and populations over time. I'm sure we can agree to that. The question is, uh, you know, do those changes have limits? And I'm sure you've heard that a million times. And I think we'll go in some pretty good depth. Uh, into that question, because I mean, according to us, I think as biblical creationists, we would say that uh, God initially, uh, you know, he would have put a considerable amount of information in, into our genomes, right? So they're stored in our genomes in compressed, hidden form. So therefore, when this information, say, is decompressed, uh, even deciphered, revealed, or unscrambled. Um, at the end of the day, that can't really be used as evidence for, say, you know, large scale pond scum to people type evolution, uh, because the changes in variation that we're going to see um, from those new traits, you know, that information was already present and stored in the genome. Um, so, I mean, it, 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 go, it goes back to, to limits. Um, do I believe that I can, you know, get a dog as small as a flea? No, whether it's physical, whether it's uh, genomic. Uh, do I believe I can get a dog, say, as, small, as, as big as an elephant? Because we do know there's animals as big as an elephant, obviously, like an elephant. Uh, no, once again, so I believe there's limits there. You might say that's physical limits based on uh, physics and factors like that. Uh, and at the end of the day, like Adam and Eve, you know, they would have been given a significant amount of design variation. So these, you know, best way I could put it is these built-in alternatives God uh, put into Adam and Eve, they'd be scrambled over time. Uh, and new traits could arise during this process. So when we get into the question, and I know you'll have a sufficient answer for this, but you know what is that observable mechanism, Jackson, you know that adds new novel information to the genome, right? Because normally what I see as answers, uh, you know, and I think you might have different answers to this, but you know I'll see say sickle cell anemia. Uh, but when you actually look at that, you know you're seeing, like a resistance to the malaria parasite, but normally that's by producing deformed hemoglobin molecules, right? So there's obviously a loss of information, a loss of function there, Wait, and you're not gonna you know, get I'm sorry, rich. I'm sorry, I think I missed something. Say, so, what were you? What were you saying about the the parasite? Like with sickle cell anemia, right? You know, it confers oh, okay, okay. resistance to malaria. Okay. Yeah, I gotcha. uh, sorry, but if you actually look at it, it's. You know, it's producing deformed hemoglobin molecules. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, the question is, you know, how are you going to get rich okay. by losing losing money? Even aerobic citrate digestion by bacteria, which we can get into. You know, if you actually look at the literature, you know, it involves the to. loss of control of the normal anaerobic citrate digestion. So once again, I mean, it's involving the decay of prior information. So as biblical creationists, we believe God wrote the genetic script. And now we're just seeing variations based on that initial genetic script, right? So those types of examples are consistent with biblical creation. But I think the big thing in our model would be uh, genetic entropy. And I'm just talking about biological entropy as in, say, you know, the degeneration of our information systems based on those accumulation of mutations over time. So uh, at the end of the day, that would be consistent, say, with the fall. Uh, and that's what we'd be seeing, you know, from then on, we'd be seeing decay, we'd be seeing change, but at the end of the day, that change uh, is limited. And you can go ahead, Jackson. 
Okay, so I wrote down a few things, but I think I want to start with with the first of all, I do want to ask you, what do you mean when you say information? You use that word repeatedly, and so I want to ask what specifically what you mean by that. I would say because you know our genomes are obviously made of uh, very specific information. Like if I look at the English language, uh, you know the English language is made out of twenty six letters, um, four letters, obviously when it comes to DNA, um, and we can make we can see obviously you know English English books. Um, like for example, if so since you're asking me what information is, uh, do you believe? say with misspellings and typographical errors that say that English book made up of 26 letters made up of that information uh, could ever turn into say like a German book or a Korean book. Uh, I guess I'm using the analogy of, of the English language, but could that happen, do you think? Well, our language has changed significantly from uh, high, was it high German to uh, old English into uh, early English to modern English, our language has changed significantly. Wouldn't that be based on more of like intelligent input? Like for example, the word Not computer, obviously, well, obviously like the word computer, you know, didn't exist 200 years ago. It exists now due to intelligent input, but would there be any intelligent input say in the change we see in living organisms? Oh, I think, well, the, the analogy with language is, uh, the point of using analogies is to make things more digestible for an audience to understand and so to we can use the the analogy with language i think very well i think it works very well because there are lots of accidental things that occur in language and you can look up the etymology of certain words and whatnot and you can see when a word gained for instance an e or an a or something like that uh that changed it into its modern spelling and so we can see the accidental changes of these words over time we can see that adding up and we can watch as the language as a whole changes over the centuries um but i mean once again like isn't that based on more intelligent like obviously molecules to man type evolution i mean there's not really any uh intelligent input it's just based on natural selection and, and random well, variation not, mutation well not necessarily uh there are examples of words where uh, there was an accidental spelling and that became popular because it was written in a novel or something like that. And so that, that, that new spelling, which was an accidental misspelling became the new spelling of that word. And so I wouldn't say that that was necessarily intelligent. Wouldn't it's that be like alteration of like, say the pre-existing, um, in that case, English language, like if we're, if we're yes. making changes and alterations of say, yes. um, you know, the existing genetic information, I mean, are we, are we really adding any new novel information? Like obviously, uh, you know, we see examples on well, Google of these information gaining mutations. What would be the best example would you say, Jackson? Well, see, then that's where the analogy breaks down because with English, uh, I mean, you can make up new words, but ultimately all words are made up. Um, and we can choose to define words however we please and whatnot, but with genes, you can have a section of gene of nucleotides that's totally non-functional become functional and specify a very important gene in an organism and that has been documented in a number of examples uh like i think notothenioid ice fish for instance they had a, a section of nucleotides that didn't do anything and it became useful and it became the section of the genes that specify their antifreeze like a proteins was that uh, based on like it was there a gene duplication involved in there too in that one no there are um or wait no i think that was the codfish i think the notothenioids were a different one i think that was in the you have that was in the atlantic the the uh the codfish the ice codfish i think it's the notothenioids that that were the ones who duplicated it repeatedly Although you also have it in the, the Zoarcid uh, uh, ice fish, who basically, they just duplicated this gene that uh, was called, um, it produced SAS, I think, or it was called SAS. It basically had a minor antifreeze function that was basically amplified, although that's not what happened in the, 
the notothenioids, which was they had a gene that specified uh, a trypsinogen, which is a uh, uh, makes, if I remember correctly, makes trypsin, which is an enzyme. But this gene, which had a functionally uh, unrelated, which was functionally unrelated, was duplicated over and over and over, and mutations occurred in it, and it gained this new function, which was uh, specifying the antifreeze glycoproteins. And so that allows these notothenoid fish to live in the, uh, the Antarctic waters. The um, so that's just one example, um, because uh, genetic duplications are often uh, a very good basis for um, generating new structures and functions. Uh, the example I like to give with the Ragavalia water strider, Ragavalia is a genus of water strider, they basically had duplications in two genes. They're Geisha and Mother Geisha. And so when the duplications happened, mutations accrued in these, and they caused, it caused them to develop these new propeller fans, which with these new propeller fans that didn't previously exist, or they didn't already have the mutations in them to generate these because they didn't have the duplicated form already, uh, these new structures appeared and allowed them to invade a new niche, which means they can go upstream now instead of just going downstream which is what all the other uh, all the other water striders can do. So there there are a number a very large number of documented cases of new structures, functions, things like that arising. It's not simply about hetero, uh, heterozygotic advantage like in the case of sickle cell anemia, although that is a popular example. Um, but it's not the example I would give when talking about beneficial mutations or. But are, are these are these changes actually adding the novel information and me like is it something meaningful or is it like because you're saying it's it's a gene that was useless, but now not based on say a mutation or it wasn't functioning so it wasn't no, functioning not, but based on say this mutation it's now f it's now begun to function and a new trait. Um, or a new uh, feature? Not necessarily. No. Um, in the case of, in the case of Ragavalia, the the water strider, the genes that were duplicated, Geisha and Mother of Geisha, were employed in some other function. I don't remember what, but they do have their they they did have their own function. But the duplicated forms of these contributed to making this new structure, these new propeller fans that they didn't previously have, and so this is a new structure that was developed because mutations occurred in their in these certain duplicated forms of these genes which are gene duplication is itself a mutation and so but, but like a, according to our model and i get what you're saying and i, I want to comment on the gene duplication as well uh you know according to our model like the species you know they're not static obviously we see that change but so, so therefore neither are the genomes so the changes that we see over time uh, you know, sometimes they're randomly, but other times it could even be in pre-planned pathways, right? According to, say, instruction from a pre-existing algorithm. Uh, so what you're saying, I mean, whether that, that new feature, that new trait, that novelty is, is being now emphasized based on the pre-existing information, uh, at the end of the day, it's not really you know, demonstrating a new novel or meaningful information. Like with gene duplication, maybe, maybe correct me if I'm wrong, like the effect of a gene, um, it, it often depends on a gene copy number. So if that organism, say, appears with extra copies of a certain gene, um, as far as I'm like, it, it may not be able to control that expression of that gene, and therefore an imbalance is going to occur in its physiology. O overall, it's going to decrease the fitness. And I think Down syndrome, um, is, is actually due to, is an abnormality due to that. Uh, yes, it's trisomy uh, 21, I think, or 23, yeah. one of those. So obviously, you know, that, that's changing the information. It's still, uh, d you know, it's, it's obviously still deleterious. And like, if I gave you a copy of a book you already have, and then, uh, you know, there's not really any new information. If I started, say, putting misspellings or typical graphical errors in so, that second or third copy of the book, don't you just have you know a more messed up, degenerated copy of say that original book? Like, is so, is that going to build a genome, Jackson? Let's let's cut through the analogies. Analogies only get us so far. Let's actually look at the data. The data we have here is that we have two duplicated copies of genes, and there are mutations that accrued in these genes that gave an organism new structures and allowed it to colonize a new environment. That's not an analogy. That actually happened. We can measure that that happened. And so we are talking about a new structure that formed due to mutations. And this is just one of a large, long list of examples. And I've been doing 
a lot of research on them recently because of RJ and I are doing a we're critiquing the answers in Genesis books, and so I've had to go through a lot of the sections on. What's on the new notes. feature exactly again? Just propeller fans. Um, I think the the paper is like. Uh, it's like, uh, taxon. There's like novel structure taxon, taxon restricted, something. Ah, oh, crap! I can look it up. Um, don't have it at my fingertips, but I can look it up at the moment because I. It's one of the papers I like to cite generally ah, taxon restricted genes at the origin of a novel trait, allowing access to a new environment. What's uh, like, I'll, I'll and, try and what's the exact, it, it, what's the exact, like, is it, a, is it a deletion? Uh, are we no, seeing like a, a gene deletion as well in, involved no, in this? It's not a deletion. It's a duplication of two genes, Gisha and mother Gisha. And you have gene, you have mutations that are incurring in these, which are causing it, which caused it to develop this new structure, which is the propeller fans. And so what you've got is you've got a new structure that occurred because of mutations. That's not an analogy. That actually happened. And so uh, it, it allowed it to colonize a new environment. And so you do... I mean, I think you have to recognize that that's what happened. Uh, and it's, this isn't the only example but I'm, I'm saying, like, obviously, natural selection is, you know, a selection process. When you get this duplicated gene, and natural selection is now acting upon this duplicated gene, and mutations are, um, you know, acting upon that duplicated gene as well, and then you're getting these new features and these new traits, you know, is that really acting on on meaningful information? Is is what I'm saying, or is it just acting I mean, on pre-existing information? Well, wait a minute. Uh, I, are, so, are you drawing a distinction between meaningful and pre-existing? If so, yeah, what is your distinction? Was this change or alteration possible based on the original genetic script? Whether it's uh, you know duplicating the original information, whether it's changing it by any means, unscrambling, deciphering. I mean, was this change based on that original genetic algorithm is, is my question, or is it just something that well, is a molecules to man type evolutionary change? All mutations um, are on pre-existing DNA. You can't have a mutation that didn't occur in pre-existing DNA. I don't know how that's kind of a paradoxical thing. To think about. Well, then how are you going to build the genome? Like, um, Obviously, to me, God wrote the genetic script. To so, you, you're saying that you know, evolution, natural selection, this type of evolution is a genetic script writer. Because so I understand I'm, how that script is going to go. Because obviously, if you look at the analogy farm, we're looking at what? single celled organism, fish, amphibian, reptile, mammal, eventually. Also, obviously, that's going to take increases of novel amounts of information. But this, these types of changes you're showing me, like, I don't see um, how, how that's going to do it. Again, it comes down. What, what do you mean when you when we're looking? If I were to look at the DNA with you, we'd just sit down and we look at DNA. Can you point out information to me in it? Can you say this specific part is the is information? Would you would you consider a protein coding gene an inform, uh, information? I would say that's that's inform. I guess the best way I could put it is to say you know to get from bacteria to man, whether indirectly or directly, obviously there's going to have to be a mechanism that adds genetic information such as, and this is what I'd be looking for is genes to obviously okay. make, you know, novelties like arms, legs, brains. So like the, the tweaking of the genome, say in a bacterium, whether through duplication and mutation, it's not going to result in a human genome. But I mean, I That's understand what you, I think, you know, it, it must be assumed in your case that duplications and mutations lead to the new genes. But we can, we can demonstrate it. My example I just gave you is a demonstration of that fact that this is a new structure that did not previously exist, which occurred. It was formed due to mutations, which allowed them to colonize a novel environment. It did not exist. It, came into existence through mutations. I'm That's saying it came is. into existence through that original genetic script, because technically the burden of proof would lie, say, with you, it Jackson, with who are saying that duplications and mutations can, say, lead from fish to fishermen, but not with those that don't, because we don't believe that that new novel information uh, because obviously we're seeing uh, more so degradation. We're seeing degeneration. Like, are you familiar, obviously, with like uh, neutral mutations? 
Am I familiar with them? Yes, the vast majority of mutations are neutral. They don't do anything. Although they can. They can come to have function, as in the case of the codfish. It had neutral mutations in this uh, section of DNA, but eventually it came to express this new function. Same with uh, bacteria. You can replace their promoter sequences with uh, like 100 base pair uh sequences and they it within like a few mutations it becomes a functional promoter sequence but are are we seeing say like with the encode project that you know most nucleotides you know they're playing now a role say in in multiple yep. overlapping codes so that means you know the beneficial mutations that we were kind of talking about earlier um which are not say deleterious at some level aren't they vanishingly rare like how often do we say because obviously the majority okay. of mutations like you said are neutral and i agree with that are the beneficial mutations the ones that would be amplified say by natural selection are those more so rare are they rare yes um both harmful and beneficial mutations are more rare than neutral mutations because the the code is because a large portion of our code doesn't do much of anything and because even the amino acids that are important to us are called um, redundant or degenerate uh, which it, sounds very malicious in my opinion but that's one of the words <laughs> I described them but the thing is we're uh, seeing from like, them. well okay. I want to explain why what why why this is important mutations are often neutral not be, not just because of this large portion that doesn't do anything they're also neutral mutations are neutral because of a redundant uh, amino acids code because you have a whole bunch of you ha can have a whole bunch of different sequences that specify the exact same amino acid leucine i think is specified by six different sequences and so if you were to if you were to change one of them one of the the uh amino or one of the nucleotides in the codon specifying leucine then you might just change it to another form of leucine or to another another codon for leucine in which case you still got leucine nothing changed and so that's why the vast majority of them are neutral. But the thing is, we're seeing now that a lot of these, say, redundant, uh, you know, genes or regions, these, I guess, junk DNA, which would constitute a bunch of different things. Um, we're actually seeing that they play important regulatory roles. We see that they're playing roles in even embryological development, um, gene expression. So we're actually seeing that the vast majority of our of our genome is functional to to some extent which would indicate that these neutral mutations are actually more near neutral which means they are de you know deleterious we're losing information so the best way i could put it, the bottom line is that you know selection it's going to remove only say the worst deleterious mutations and then amplify only the best and official mutations so the best way i could put it is this means that the accumulating damage is large largely invisible because natural selection it's not really going to act okay. on these near neutral mutations they're unselectable kind of like rust on a car while adaptations tend to be highly visible like antibiotic resistance so even if you jackson say present me with i don't know even a thousand examples of say adaptation via beneficial point mutation whatever it is you're still failing to address the key issue which would technically be net gain versus net loss because adaptation obviously it, it, it explains the fine tuning tuning of the environment because that's what we're looking at is fine tuning but it doesn't really explain the astounding internal workings of life in general okay. it does not begin so, to explain the mystery of the genome okay okay well uh, you've covered a, an incredible range of of topics we, I think it just comes down to is is our no, no, no. genome it, degenerating, right? Okay, it's it's not. Um, genetic entropy is bogus. No one, no geneticists take it seriously except. Yeah, but I, I just demonstrated that it actually is it because actually near does, neutral mutations they're not selected against or for. Okay, what Sanford does is Sanford ignores beneficial mutations. They're not part of his model because you just admitted they're rare. No, I said that they're less common. I mean. In a sense, they're rare. Uh, it depends on what. You, also, it depends on what you mean as beneficial. But okay, first, for one thing, that we're kind of you're bringing up a lot of topics and bringing them up in sort of ways that, for instance, let's bring up. Let's go back to encode for a moment there because you brought that up. Do, do you do you know what encode meant by functionality? 
when they said something, a section of gene, a section of DNA was functional. Do you know what they meant by that? Well, I know that they're more, they're playing more important roles, say as regulatory no, roles, gene expression roles. Is. These are still roles in general. I, I know no. what you're going to get at. You can explain it, but go ahead. So when they said something was functional, they meant it was transcripted, which is indeed sure a large part of our gene, or a large part of our DNA is transcripted. Yeah. But that doesn't, it might, that doesn't, parts that don't do anything are transcripted. That's, that, I just told you they do stuff. They play important regulatory roles. No, we see no. that they're playing roles. No, 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 no. In, in parts, embryo. This is function, Jackson. No, no, not actually. A lot of the parts of our DNA don't have any function. That's why the pseudogenes, for instance, don't have function. ALU pseudo, uh, ALUs, ALU retrotransposons don't have function. There are lots of trans retrotranspositional uh, parts of our genome that don't have any function. These but, leftovers that you're talking about, they do have very important functions. Actually, a lot of Jackson. them don't, but that's not the point. The point I'm trying to get is, and I can demonstrate a lot of them don't have function. Um, well, hey, let me, for one hey, thing, actually, well, let, I want to finish first because this ENCODE thing is really important. Uh, they defined functionality in such a way that it's virtually useless. Is it technically true? Sure, you can define functionality as it's transcripted and then say a large part is functional, that's not technically wrong. It's true. A large part is transcripted. But so what? That doesn't tell us literally anything about the ones about differentiating the parts that do work from the parts that don't work. For instance, we have uh, the Gulo pseudogene, which uh, allows us or which doesn't allow us to, to synthesize ascorbic acid. I mean, yeah, the, the part for that is still... It's still transcripted, but, um, you know, it's still functional according to ENCODE, but it doesn't do anything. It's literally broken. It has no function. And yet it has no function in the sense that it's not doing anything. And yet they call it functional. Would you consider that useful? Well, let's just say, because according to my model. Yes or no. Would everything... you consider that useful? The thing is, we only speak one to two percent of the actual, you know, DNA. Yes language. or no. Would you consider that useful? It could have been at one one point, and now we're experiencing the the degeneration. When Let me ENCODE, just say, when ENCODE did their project, where they declared that such segments as Gulo were functional, would you consider that useful? It depends what the use is, because like I said, we it has no usage. One to two percent of the DNA. It's very code. well studied and very well understood. It has no function. Okay. So yes or no? Is it is it useful to describe it as functional? For argument's sake, let's say that that pseudogene, that specific one, doesn't have any function. Let's say it, but all I'm saying is, you know, my Honda Civic, when it came off the assembly line, okay, it okay. worked great. Air conditioning was working, brakes were perfect, no rust. Over time, the car has degenerated. The air conditioner broke. That just shows evidence of obviously degeneration from the fall that we have experienced these accumulations. So if something's broken, it doesn't really provide evidence for that type of evolution that you're talking about. I'm not about. talking about evolution. I'm talking about is it is it useful to say a thing that has no function is functional? Is that useful? a useful construct? I'm saying that I'm going to expect yes or no. If there's no actual, say, regulatory role, some type of role in the embryo, it doesn't make any any proteins, no, was, it doesn't regulate useless. any other genes, it does nothing. I'm not what saying that our genome is 100% functional, but I'm saying enough of it is functional, where those neutral mutations are now near neutral mutations. They're building up in the population. We are degenerating. I mean, are you, so, are you denying that? Am I denying what? That neutral mutations are occurring in our population? Absolutely not. Um, but population but, geneticists themselves even agree that we are degenerating. I mean, we're not, we are accumulating. Which population mutations. geneticist? John Sanford? John Sanford uh, references many population geneticists that yes, are actually he evolutionists he in does. his book. They're not like even creationists. Moto Kimura, but he misunderstands yeah. and misrepresents their models to make his argument. For instance, he ignores beneficial mutations. He already like admitted they're rare. They're so not she, just rare, they occur. But the, the thing is, natural is, selection will amplify those, but those millions of you okay. know deleterious near neutral mutations, they're building up. You can't select those out. That's it's not no no no, no possible ways. What the point is with 
the with beneficial mutations is these things are uh i will ask him rj um the beneficial mutations outweigh a lot of other mutations and that's part of what researchers have discovered have you actually gone through the sources that sanford puts forth in his arguments and read what these other population geneticists like moto kimura have said i've read what they said in uh, i know there's a rebuttal to john sanford's book i think the guy's name was i don't know scott or something some type of blog so he had some uh he had some references but no i've never gone and actually like read their papers or okay. anything I would really recommend it. Uh, go to Google Scholar, actually read the papers that the, that he is referencing and go see for yourself if what he's saying is true. Um, I, I always go to Google Scholar when I see someone something that someone has written about a paper. Like even e even when I get um, because I I follow Science Magazine, even when they send me like their secondary sources, like somebody wrote an article about a technical paper. I don't want to read that article they wrote. I want to go and read the technical paper so I can see if they're accurately, accurately presenting it. You see what I'm saying? No, I, I, under, I understand that. Right. But I mean, it, and, and break it down for me, because obviously, you know, you, you, you know your stuff here. This is what your education is. Well, but okay. if, if I'm making it simple, like, and, and just show me where I'm wrong here. I just kind of want to make an analogy. So like, the, uh, okay, okay, go ahead. I'll, I'll go after you're done. The, the major problem with, his, with Sanford's argument, and I'm not saying beneficial mutations aren't rare, they in a lot of cases they are um i mean you know we're a lot we're a lot less likely to you know hear about beneficial mutations occurring in human populations even though they do happen but they i, I know, just want to correct very I, often i just want to correct one thing i'll let you continue when i say beneficial okay. mutations i more i more so mean like a beneficial outcome because a lot of times these beneficial mutations are due to a loss of function and a loss of information so you're Although, still not getting rich by losing money I mean, although a lot of in a lot of other cases, they're caused by, for instance, gene duplications where you're adding segments and whatnot. Um, uh, for instance, the uh, the apolipoprotein A1 mutation in a family in Italy. Have you heard of that one? Uh, no. You want to explain it? OK, so uh, for anyone who doesn't know um, the the mutation, we all have a gene that specifies this protein called apolipoprotein A1. Basically, what it does is it allows us to digest cholesterol. So there's a family in Italy, and they had a mutation in their apolipoprotein A1 uh, gene. Uh, they it, it switched out an arginine for a cysteine. Basically, it was just this one little point mutation, and it allows the, they are now more likely they're they are better able to digest cholesterol, to digest larger amounts of cholesterol than people are generally, which means they are less likely to get heart disease for instance but it still sounds like like i don't know that exact one but it still sounds like like if i look at the aerobic citrate digestion you know that involved the loss of the control of the normal anaerobic citrate digestion but well, what you're saying it just seems like if i looked in the re the literature and i will i mean if it's a loss of control of, of something if it's a lose control of turned it, on and off it's not really they, novel they didn't lose control of the gene though the gene's function was amplified it, exactly. So it's amplified and emphasized based on, say, you know, whether it's decompressing or, or unscrambling right. of existing information. That's not going to get your bacteria to biologists. But that's remember, just still consistent with my model. Go ahead. Okay, but remember, I gave an example earlier with the notothenoid fish of a section of gene, a section of nucleotides that did nothing, that became a functional gene. And this happens a lot. It happens in bacteria. There's actually a really interesting paper published only a few months ago about about uh, inserting 100 base pair sequences uh, instead of promoters in bacteria. And within like one or two mutations, they turn that sequence that is random nonsense into a, into a, a promoter, a promoter sequence. Not, they're not doing it consciously. Of course they have no brain. They have no control over their own genetics, but, Mutations are occurring such that these sec these sec sequences, these segments, they don't do anything, have become functional. And that's really not all that uncommon. I mean, sure, it's rare, but uh, it does happen. The notothenoid fish is just one example. It's a really interesting example. Um, but we do see examples of new structures, new functions, 
uh, sequences that had no function that become functional. We are do are see these, these the types of changes that are going to build the genome, though, that you're that you're what telling you mean by about? build the genome? Well, obviously, you know, we're going to have to explain, you know, this this uh, information system chock full of even meta meta information overlapping codes. I mean, if we look at the phenotype, are these changes producing any type of significant phenotypic change or is it just Sometimes. Very um, it, for example, in, um, I think Midas, uh, cichlids, uh, they have a lot of phenotypic plasticity in their, uh, jaw shape, which has contributed to how they speciate. Um, and so, yeah, in some cases, yeah. Well, um, in another case, the, um, uh, the, the, the lizards, the, uh, the Italian wall lizards on Padmacaru are another example where they where the scientists took a po took a very small population of these lizards from this nearby island Podkopiste. And it's like five males and five females and they dropped them off on Padmakaru in the the 1970s and in just over you know, 30 years or so these guys developed uh, novel uh, structures and they directionally it they they it was okay. they underwent directional selection towards becoming herbivores, and they even developed a yeah. sequel valve, which is what herbivores use to digest their plant material. Which, because the original population was insect insectivores, so they underwent directional selection and developed new structures to accommodate that. Well, on on that one, like. Um, if I could just comment on the lizard one, because I think that's a common one too. Like that, you know, let's say new or novel, um, you know, let's say muscular valve that they found uh, between, I think it was the small and large intestine. If you actually look at that, it's really just an enlargement of muscles already present yes, in it's its an wall. So in other words, far from being, you know, tr a truly new novel feature, like you're saying, the shift in available food, Jackson, allowed the lizards with larger muscles at this juncture I'm referring to, to be more successful at feeding and reproducing. But so, the important thing is, let me just finish. Okay, if these lizards were returned to their original habitat, that sequel valve feature, which is cool, it's, it's a cool variation based on, you know, it's not proving any type of pond scum to people evolution, but that may actually dwindle based on the lizards return to an insectivore diet, though. like you just said. So, I mean, that's not really, you know, we don't know that though. Change. That's, that's an, that's an assumption, but we don't have any evidence to indicate that that would actually be the case. But uh, again, I'm, I'm left to ask, what would you expect as a as an example of something that in your mind would allow ponds to people evolution? Because I've given you examples of new structures that have arisen through uh, mutations. I've given you examples of non-functional sequences that have become functional. So what sort of mutation are you expecting? Well, let me, I'm going to, I'll give you an answer to that. I just want to, because we kind of went on, well, I mean, we've been on a little bit of a few uh, rabbit trails. I just want to say one last thing about um, the genetic entropy, because when it comes to the near neutral mutations and when it comes to the beneficial mutations, like you're saying that he ignored, uh, you know, obviously a species, Jackson, it, it can go, it can undergo the minor adaptive fine tuning to its environment. Like you're saying, mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's observable. I agree. But at the same time, Okay. The degeneration process is going on in many other ways, like to make it simple for the audience, because some of the, some of this I'm sure would go over people's head, like picture a 10 year old car. It is degenerating in all possible ways, Jackson, whether I install new windshield wipers. Th the question is, has the car stopped degenerating? I'm going to ask you that question. Has the car stopped de degenerating if I change the brakes or switch the tires out? You're going back to analogies. We need to look at the actual data. Analogies are fine up to a point. I don't use. I don't really like to use analogies when I'm talking to people. When I'm explaining to people, I think it's a good analogy. I, think it confuses about, the issue. I, I really, honestly, do think it confuses the issues. Um, I mean, like when we talk about language ev evolving, changing, whatever. Um, it's yeah, sure. It's it's sort of useful in a sort of way to explain that language does change. But language doesn't have DNA. Language doesn't have a phenotype or anything like this. It's just a, a construct that we've invented to help explain this, this process. When we're actually talking about mutations, it's better to provide a specific example of a mutation to show, hey, actually, this thing does happen. It's not just something that theoretically could happen. It actually has, we have ex evidence to indicate 
the evidence that is positively indicative of this thing actually having having happened. Well, it's because um, it's it's because in my I'll give you the answer because in my model, like I said at the beginning, uh, you know, this information say stored in the genome, whether it's in compressed, hidden form, when it's decompressed or deciphered, these new traits were it, it's expected, okay, because it's acting on that original genetic script. So, if you want to say that, you know, if you want to believe this bacteria type to biologist type uh, evolution, you know, the burden of proof is actually on you to demonstrate sufficiently that, you know, these changes based on mutation and natural selection are creating novelties. You know, I wanna see new genes that are gonna be capable of creating, uh, whether it's legs, arms, um, say dinosaur to bird, you know, look, where's that okay. scale information? How's that uh, feather information gonna come from that scale? Because that information so, wasn't present originally. So are you aware, for instance, that you are aware, for instance, that uh, feathers and hair are ultimately built from the same sort of proteins, right? They're both beta carotens or alpha yeah. beta or beta, alpha carotens, whatever they are. Yeah, I was just gonna, yeah. Okay, so we have these two structures that are both derived from a singular source, which is already in the skin, so it's really just a modification and amplification of something that already existed. But even so by before, you saying amplification or, you know, emphasizing so these, a trait it, you, you're demonstrating that these changes are coming from a pre-existing source i mean exactly all exactly. genetic that's, that's changes with my have model. to they have to and that's something i that's something i asked you earlier is how you can't possibly have a change that didn't already exist that's a nonsensical if God wrote that original genetic script and now we're just seeing a variation based on that genetic well, script, the burden of proof, Jackson, is on you. Let Well, let me let me ex explain. Well, first of all, the burden of proof is on both of us. If we have models at all, then we both have burden of proof to make to to show that our models are actually true and testable, verifiable, et cetera. And actually evolution is uh, and I can give you plenty of examples of that. But at the moment, I, I want to stick with the feather topic. Um, Yes, feathers are an amplification and modification on a structure that already existed, these beta keratins, which are already in the skin. So they, so these, through whether it's genetic drift or natural selection, sexual selection, whatever, these things became more numerous. They, you know, grew, they grew new structures on, you know, on themselves, not, of course, not consciously, but they became modified slowly over time and we can see all the structures uh, that are in birds were actually developing long, long before birds were ever around. There's a really interesting paper. Um, I think by the lady's name is uh, Andrea now in a U uh, for anyone who wants to look it up. It's, it's like a, the 160 million year making of the birds, a technical paper on traits that are in birds that were around long before birds were. For instance, the uh, the avian respiratory system, the the system of air sacs within the within it that make it lightweight. Dinosaurs had those or have those. Even if you don't think birds are related to dinosaurs, dinosaurs still have uh, the post cranial pneumaticity. They still have the same sort of respiration system. Even if you think they're you know entirely unrelated, um, the posture that dinosaurs that theropods specifically have, although which is the standing horizontal or standing yeah, horizontally instead of vertically, like the old cartoons used to show dinosaurs, um, which birds also have. So that's something else that birds inherited from dinosaurs, uh, feathers, birds also inherited feathers from dinosaurs because we now know that most theropods, uh, the vast majority of theropods had feathers. In fact, we found feathers in other lineages of dinosaurs, like, uh, had feathers, Cholindodromius, which was another ornithischian, had feathers. Um, and so these are features that are all getting tinkered with very slightly, being independently modified. You know, starting over here with something that's definitely not a bird. And you're modifying and, uh, you know, uh, well, amplifying still... certain features until you actually get to birds. But at no point would but you ever just be able to look at it and say, that's the first bird. And it, it, it's a cute, it's a cute just so story, but like, obviously it's not there's though, still because it allowed us to make predictions. It allowed us but, to make the prediction of Microraptor, which was verified in 2003. 
But I'm saying, well, wouldn't you agree that there's still a major morphological difference that exists between feathers and scales? I mean, th th there is still a huge difference in a huge gap. Is there between I mean, such a structure? The actually, well, really, the uh, the entirety of the uh, evolution of the feather has already been. If I remember correct, there are a number of papers that discuss the development of feathers. They're really, really, really intricate uh, papers that discuss this whole thing. And so, I, again, I encourage you to look them up. Look up the literature on the development of feathers. It's really interesting. Well, like if, well, if, if we take something like Archaeopteryx, weren't there, and correct me, weren't there fully functional feathers that existed prior to the existence of some of these apparent transitional yes. uh, creatures? Yes, in, in uh, Archaeopteryx, yes, is the the one of the earliest birds that we found in the in the record, and yeah. it has feathers, which indicates that feathers were already on dinosaur, already on theropod dinosaurs before um, before birds branched off. And we know uh, pterosaurs actually had these things called uh, pycnofibers or pycnofibers, whichever one it is, which are these little thin, fine, fibrous sort of materials that are a lot like feathers, but they're not feathers. Um, well, well again, actually, from what I understand, uh, you know, the earliest, say, birds discovered, uh, you'd probably know the names of them better than me, but they actually have the fully modern features, and they're already modern in form and microscopic in detail. So, I mean, is there a big line of, of, of transitionary um, yes. evidence showing this? Yes, actually, um, the paper... Uh, yes, and thank you, Ration, for sending me the paper. Um, uh, yeah, there are... You've got the... Let me see if I can find it if it's in... Yes, you have feathered theropods because birds are highly derived uh, coelurosaurs. They're a specific group of coelurosaurs called uh, aviale. And so you've got these avialians who are members of a group called Manoraptora and we already know most, if not all, Manoraptorans had feathers. So, which means that the common ancestor of birds and these other Manoraptorans already had feathers. Uh, and since we've seen that Ornithischians also had feathers, either they independently developed feathers, or the common ancestor had feathers. Uh, it's like, which is more likely, because then when you look outside the dinosaur morphs, and you find the pterosaurs, they have little pycnofibers, which are a lot like feathers and so you find this very very slow progression of feathers and again i encourage you don't take my word for anything go look up the literature don't just listen to me and take my word for it don't don't do that uh no one in the chat do that don't ever just take my word for it go look up these things because if i get them wrong then and you just take my word for it then you'll get them wrong and that's not good it depends, yeah. And, and when I look at these papers, like whether they're the adequate, pattern. awesome. If they're inadequate and the evidence for such evolution, evolutionary origin is is non-existent, I mean, I'll go look into that and see if it's more than just a, a just so story. We'll see. Or... Here's why it's not a just so story. What makes why? the hallmark of a good model or a good theory is its ability to make predictions. Evolution makes predictions. Microraptor was one such prediction. This guy named William Beebe, back in the uh, early 1900s, predicted that we should find because he studied feather. He studied birds, and he's noticed that while birds were young, they developed feathers on their hind limbs. And so, what he he uh, are their little legs. He reasoned that there should have been a step in the evolution of birds where they had flight feathers on their front and back limbs. And we found Microraptor in 2003, which has flight feathers on its front and back limbs. A spitting image of a picture drawn 100 years earlier called Tetrapteryx. So that is a testable, verifiable model that is based on the evidence. Whoops, not my computer. So what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, obviously, like I said, I need to see the, um, you know, the papers, I would have to look into them. I would have to see, because uh, I still think that those big morphological changes are going to require that type of... Here, look, I'll put uh, one in the, in the chat for us right now. Go ahead. Keep going. Keep going. Well, I mean, the best thing I can say is uh, with common ancestry, obviously, we're going to have to see 
um, whether or not there's limits. Uh, and what you're saying is interesting. You know, obviously, I'm going to go look at that uh, literature with that. But I'd still like to know if you uh, believe that there's limits. Like, do you believe we can get, say, a bacteria um, as big as a whale? Because we know there's animals as big as a whale, like a whale. Or do you believe there's limits there, whether it's physical, whether it's... I think uh, the largest bacterium, or maybe it's an archaean, is a Theo margarita, if I remember correctly. Um, but it's it's single-celled organisms <coughs> can't get very large. There's a there's a ratio of, of cell surface area to volume, and once you get beyond a certain point, it becomes more or less impossible to maintain metabolism. Uh, do you because believe you can't that? Well, do you believe that whales awesome. and bacteria share a common ancestor, like these single-celled organisms? Ultimately, yes, because they share a they share a number of of similarities. Uh, I mean, of course, from bacteria, it would have to be cellular similarities, but yes. Well, obviously, like if I looked at say, uh, you know, Microsoft PowerPoint, it's going to have millions of lines of code, and Microsoft Word, you know, the, the word processing program is going to have millions of lines of code as well. And if I were to put these Jackson, say both side by side, and let's just say I hired someone with a lot of time, energy, and maybe a government grant, you know, they're going to find tens of thousands of identical lines of code. That, and I you can, believe I mean, Kent Hovind has literally that? said that sentence to me. And, and how is that proving universal common ancestry over well, say common design? Because obviously we know that, that those programs were built, uh, through common design? It's a fair question. Again, we need to avoid using analogies because analogies obfuscate the issues. Avoid the analogy altogether because it's, oh. it's really, it's going to, it's going to confuse things. Okay. So but if first, we, if, if we ignore the, if, if we ignore the analogy then. Because we're, because of this analogy, I want to, I want to demonstrate why this is a bad analogy. Do analogies, or, <laughs> do analogies. <laughs> My tongue is, what is it? My tang is tangled. Um, <laughs> do programs reproduce sexually or asexually? Well, obviously, programs don't reproduce, but at no. the end of the day, they, that initial reproduction, that's a problem have, for you guys. I do mean, how programs that have about? metabolism? No, of course not. No, they don't. They So they don't have any way to transmit features, phenotypes, from one generation to the next. They have no way to do that. But I'm still showing you that you can look at, say, the no. similarities in, in living organisms and say the similarities so, in modes of transportation and conclude, wow, you know, this so, is an awesome designer, whether it's of modes of transportation or whether it's modes or these living organisms. So, I mean, you know what a paternity test is. You've you ever seen the show, like uh, the Maury Povich show? I uh, I don't think I've seen that show, but I am aware of obviously paternity tests. Okay. Yes. So paternity tests. So uh, in your own words, tell me what what you think paternity tests do. Well, I think they're going to show um, obviously similarities uh, molecularly and see if you know that father, or that father is um, my right. father. Exactly. Right. Those, yeah. So, so why does the child have the same genetics to an extent as the father. Why is that? Well, because that genome, whether you're looking at, are you looking at the nuclear DNA when it comes to that? Nuclear like obviously, DNA, mitochondrial DNA. Why? Why yeah, exactly. is this child yeah, exactly. assigned so to this parent? Be, yeah, so you're going to be using those gene sequences. You're going to be looking at them, much like I explained how the guy's going to be looking at the lines of code, right. whether it's Microsoft. Why do we, or I'm going to conclude that he's my father. Okay, but why? Why, when we look at these genes, are they concluding that this child, this is the offspring of this father? Well, I think we can see that. Well, I, I, I believe that we can see that through um, observational science here. But you're going to say that you know humans and say whales, pine trees, and elephants all share a common ancestor. So that's when <laughs> you're making that giant. Uh, inference based on what we can do here with operational science. I mean, is, is that what your ultimate conclusion would be based on these paternity tests? So ultimately, in a sense, yes. Also, I'm really glad I left. I'm sorry. I'm really glad you said pine trees and elephants because <laughs> I'm glad we I both watched the same talk and we both know what we're talking about. I'm very glad we both saw that. 
Um, you know what? You're the first funny. person who did know what I was talking about. Oh, really? Oh, that's sad. I'm sorry. Probably, I, it, I've done probably 10 discussions in the last two weeks, and people just didn't get it. But, I mean, oh, it that's unfortunate is. because that, that was a gold golden talk, I think. But so, so, the, so the point here is they assigned this offspring to this father because of the genetic similarities. Because there's a certain suite of similarities we would expect in this child if this is the father, right? Or yeah. vice versa. We test the child and we see, okay, he has these, he has this suite of of genetic characteristics. Which of these males also has that one? One of them has to. And so when you look at these characteristics, when you do the same sort of paternity test, you do it on a larger scale. You've heard of like 23andMe and Ancestry.com. Uh, they do the same sorts of tests, although they do it on larger scale. Yeah, they look at things like your mitochondrial haplogroups and things like that. And so, what they can what they can conclude, and what what they're literally in the business of doing is showing your ancestry, your human ancestry, of course, uh, mapped across the globe. And then you're gonna put that genomic map, you know, next to different genomic maps of different animal groups, right? And you're gonna compare the because it's literally the exact same thing. You oh, are I, still doing. I, I, compl exact... I completely understand what, what you're saying, but like, if I were to ask you, this is a serious question. Uh, okay. You know, do you have parents and grandparents? Mm -hmm. Were they human? So what you're asking is about speciation, and I'm very much happy to go into this discussion with you. So you know how speciation occurs. Right, whether well, allopatric or sympatric, right? You have one species, a parent species, and it splits into daughters, whether through you know the population splits and undergo one half undergoes natural selection, whatever. No, it, yeah, and I want you to explain this to me, but I just want to know, uh, based on your so obviously your parents' grandparents were human, their parents' grandparents were human. How far do you have to go back? And I understand the law of monophyly, but obviously, if chimps and humans share a common ancestor, how far do you have to go back before they become non human? You know, what would be that? that well, do you, well, by non-human, do you mean by homo sapien or just homo genus? Well, what would be that common ancestor bet between chimpanzees and humans? What well, would be that, that common ancestor? That, would that well, be like more of an ape, ape-like so, ancestor? Well, I mean, we both are apes by definition. But the, the first homo sapiens appeared about 300,000 years ago. The first homo species appeared, uh, what is it, two point two and a half million years ago, something like that. The ancestor between us and chimps and bonobos lived approximately um, lived approximately uh, five to seven million years ago. But I just find it funny that all of human history, you know, we we trace that paternity test back, and our grandparents, our great grandparents, our great 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 grandparents, it's always been human humans have produced humans but you're trying to say you go back long ago and far away and all of a sudden we have these ancestors with whether it's apes you know whether it's uh homo erectus whether it's i mean how well can you demonstrate that well empirically? for instance we can demonstrate absolutely that we uh share genetic sequences with neanderthals uh we know this because we actually have neanderthal dna yeah, and, and I would believe, I would and, say that Neanderthals are human, so I have no problem with so that. So, Neanderthals are a different species of human than we are. They're Homo Neanderthalensis. Well, I mean, some guy named them a different species, whether that's so you know, have, God's classification or not. I would just say that they were a post-flood type of human that, based on adaptation, probably environmental factors, that's why you see those odd features. That's why you see those... Um, types well, of difference. It's, it's got. I have no problem with that at all. I mean, that goes into a whole other slew of issues because there's no, there's absolutely zero evidence that somehow we could develop a common ancestor with another, with the, another group of humans that genetically distinct from us in such a short time period. There's absolutely no evidence for that, based on our, uh, based on our life cycle and our generations and things like that. But well, based on that DNA variety, say initially after in my model, um, initially into post flood. Because at the end of the day, if we're looking at genetic entropy now, which I understand you don't believe in, well, no um, really but believe if, it, if there's the a answer. point of least entropy, least genetic entropy, I mean, those subgroups, whether it's Homo erectus, whether it's Homo neanderthalus, I mean, those were just varieties of human. That's what I would say in my model. And I don't have any problem with that based well, on the DNA variety after the flood. Can I tell you something a creationist said? Sure. 
creationist Todd Wood. Are you aware of him? He was in um, uh, uh, he was Genesis. In Genesis Paradise Lost, wasn't he? No, the other one. Um, uh, oh, uh, it's uh, Genesis History. There we go. Yeah. Was, yeah. Um, he says on Answers in Genesis website that Homo, that us, we are in the same kind as Homo habilis and Australopithecus sediba. So do you agree with his conclusion? He based that conclusion, mind you, on looking at the morphological similarities because we don't have DNA of habilis, of habilines or Australopithecines. We just don't have it. They're too old. Um, he looked at the morphological similarities that we share with Australopithecines and habilines and concluded based on that, and he is a creationist by all rights, believes the earth is 10,000 years old, etc. Flood happened. He believes that we are related to these guys who have features drastically different from our own, even though we're well, all still human. Well, the thing is, just like there'd be a, a variation of humans based on that, uh, you know, those tens of thousands of DNA differences placed into each original kind, there's going to be a whole variety of ape type animals. So whether he mistaken one or the other, I mean, I would definitely classify Homo erectus, um, obviously humans, Homo erectus in the human category, whether okay. there's extinct type of apes, obviously Australopithecus would have just been um, some type of, of champ. Well, to him, a Sediba is a human, is in the Homo, or the human hollow barrenman. I'd have to go look at the A. Sediba. So obviously they're looking at the bones. If I put out a whole pile of dog skulls, but dogs were extinct and you're trying to label these and categorize these, I mean, there's going to be some people making different interpretations and others making other interpretations. So I'd have to go look at uh, the different interpretations because obviously, what's his name, Todd? Well, Todd, Wood, well, as it happens, actually the paleoanthropologist evolutionists agree with him that A. Sediba is related to us. So I think we're all on the same page in that case. Uh, but what would, what uh, would ICR answer? That? Are you saying there's conflicting interpretations between the different yes. creationists? Um, and actually, there's a whole lot of conflicting interpretations. Some creationists classify Erectus as you know, just an ape. Uh, some classify Erectus you as a human. Uh, and it, it's uh, actually RJ and I. RJ showed me a paper just the other day. Um, RJ, can you go find it? The paper on uh, the paper on the different people uh, who disagree, the different creationists who disagree on the taxonomy of the humans. If you could go find that one for me, that'd be great. I, um, I, I've seen those those disagreements, but obviously if we're looking at these fossils, these bones found in the dirt, say of thousands okay. of years ago, in, in your case, millions of years ago, there's going to be morphological differences and it's not always going to be easy to label. I agree. Each, I absolutely if, agree with that. I if, I, if I showed you, and you have to agree, if I showed you, you know, 300 different dog skulls, whether Would we consider them different species, possibly? We, we, we might. I actually well, said something similar. Today, something so we can do it. But I'm saying if they were extinct thousands of years ago, you start digging them up. It's like, wow, which category? If I took all the labels off of different cars, so whether it's the Chevy Cruze or whether it's the high-end day Atlanta a truck or a, Toyota, or a Toyota Camry, you're going to have a oh, difficult time categorizing. I know they don't reproduce this. Style. I'm just trying to make an analogy. Here we go. I found the um, – Labeling those as whether, hey, that's from – you know, Toyota, that's from Honda. So uh, it's understandable that they're making different interpretations based on some of the, especially if it's an extinct ape type creature that doesn't live today, you're going to have those mistakes because we're, we're interpreting those bones well, based on an animal we don't see today. Oh, I wouldn't say it's a mistake. I would actually agree with Todd Wood that we are related to ACD, but, but, the, but there is something I, I do want to ask. Uh, I don't know how much longer you want to go on. How um, long have we been going at it for? Uh... Maybe um about an hour by now, I think. But I do want to ask, and because you repeatedly refer to what you believe as your model, and the hallmark of a good model, because then any everyone has a model, you know. But what makes a good model is the ability of said model to be to falsifiable. Make, yes, a to be falsifiable. B to make verifiable predictions. So what would falsify your model of of by of mutations and these variations mutations causing just these variations within the kinds what well, would falsify that 
Well, for one, I would say that, uh, and, and I'll give you that answer too, but my model really is based on DK and degeneration. And I understand we disagree about this, but I do believe that we see genetic entropy. Um, I do see um, that, you know, the universe is winding down. There is a, a form of, you know, order to disorder. So I think this is consistent with the model. In regards to falsifying it, I mean, we are predicting that most of the genome uh, is fully functional. I think we're seeing that with a lot of these genes. I think we're seeing, uh, you know, regulatory functions, gene expression. I would expect some type of uh, pseudo gene, some type of junk based on that uh, degeneration. Um, so if 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 we were to see that most of the of the genome isn't functional and it really is based on evolutionary leftovers, I think in a way um, that would falsify it. And I think if we've seen a ton of these. Uh, you know, information adding uh, mutations. Um, I do believe that that would provide sufficient evidence that, you know, these types of lower life forms could have evolved into all the life we see today. But at the end of the day, I don't see that. I just see mutations and natural selection acting upon pre existing information. I'd have to see the opposite of that. I'd have how, to see the opposite of that. How does mutations and natural selection acting on genes differ? from what you think I would expect as an evolutionist for evolution to occur. What do you think is the difference? I think the difference is that, like I said before, I believe that, you know, God wrote the initial genetic no. script. Now what do you think is the difference for me? Obviously. What do you think between natural selection and mutations? What is the difference between that and what you think I expect to occur in evolution? Would you agree that at one point we had, um, lifeless, li lifeless chemicals that obviously evolved uh, somehow into a single celled organism. Ultimately, sure, but it's not evolution. That's abiogenesis. No, I, I understand. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I understand that's abiogenesis. Obviously, you need that for the coherent theory. But at the end of the day, we're talking about change. Well, I could I, honestly, I could honestly concede to you that God created life with the snap of his fingers, and you still have to deal with all the evolutionary data. I, I understand because we're looking at change in allele frequency and population over time. So we obviously need those organisms there with the alleles, uh, you know, the variations of the genes to, to right. see the change. So, right. um, okay. So from single cell organism to, to a multi cell organism through um, like colonization or how, how did that happen? Yeah, actually there's a lot of really, really interesting research with uh, vulvacines. Uh, they're a type of algae. They operate as RJ once put it uh, near multicellularity. <laughs> Um, these guys are literally on the edge. Um, I remember when, when I did my talk with Hoven back in the day, long, long time ago, um, one of the things he asked me was, where are the examples of two, uh, you know, protists going around together? You know, we have one, we have examples of one, and we have examples of dozens. You know, where's the example of the two that are together? Actually, we do have those. Uh, gonium is an example. Uh, it's a little, it's a little, uh, I'll put it, actually, I'll put it in the side, in the, the open chat so everyone can see it. Um, gonium, it's an algae, go look it up, it's a vulvacine algae. Basically, gonium is one of these little guys, and they go around in little pairs. Um, but, interestingly, so algae, so these vulvacine algae, so they can go from being, from unicellularity to colonial, colonial groupings, and differentiate their jobs, which obviously you would have to do uh, if you're, you know, an organism. If you're a multicellular organism, you obviously have to differentiate your cellular jobs. But you also have to have, you also have to have allo recognition, where you recognize all of your cells. So you have to go through, ultimately, a, you know, unicellular. You have to go through this unicellular phase, and then, which makes all these other cells, and you'd have to have them recognize each other and differentiate their jobs, etc. And so there's a lot of really interesting work going on in that. Again. I encourage you to look up the literature. Don't take my word for it. Um, well, let's just say for argument's sake, okay, you can demonstrate this single single cell to multicellular um, cellular organism. So I'm trying to, um, is, is that what you're saying? I mean, I wouldn't say we've worked out all this stuff. I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't go that far and, you know, be that arrogant about it. But well, like, is it something you can like, you, that is demonstrate, you know, that is. It is very interesting research that discusses possible mechanisms for colonializing and multicellularity. That's okay. what I would say. Well, okay. Let's say for argument's sake, now you got that, you know, 
population of multi cell um, multicellular organisms. Would you say that those single cell organisms? Obviously, you wouldn't say it's just one single cell organism. Would you say there was many different ones that had? Is, is it like one tree of life, or is it a little bit more bushy at the bottom? Would you say? Oh, I'd say absolutely, it's bushy at the bottom okay. because with, among prokaryotes, you have horizontal gene transfer and stuff like that, and that's yeah, yeah, absolutely. And genes all over the place you got transfer of our plasmids and all this other stuff that's going on so yeah i'd say it's okay. a bush and then for eukaryotes it's more of the the typical tree is you know you see in text in textbooks and online and whatnot now um when you actually have i mean when it comes to even the horizontal gene transfers like you said that's interesting because i would say you know in in a in a common design type model you know he would give those organisms the means to say adjust to changing environments by the acquisition of pre-existing information because that's what they're doing right they're transferring the different information but when that multi-celled organism what did that evolve into like what was so couldn't by that reasoning you just say everything already had we could say all of life is related it just already had the necessary genetic algorithm whatever you called it earlier to create everything couldn't well, we just say that well, if it's design variation, but I mean, from what I'm saying here with, with the, the single cell to multi cell, well, uh, what did it evolve into? I well, mean, not necessarily what it specifically evolved into, but let's say if we were to take an amoeba, okay. Uh, if we're going to make, you know, a change from an amoeba to something that, you know, has that necessary, um, extra inf information, it's going to have to mutate because and correct me if I'm wrong, like an amoeba, it has limited genetic information. Everything has uh, limited for a, uh, a protoplasm. Everything has limited amounts of genes. Sure. And if you're using information as genes, I would agree with, with that, but only in that sense. Well, how's that amoeba going to increase, you know, the information? Cause it's going to have to need to continue to, to in, in order for say a heart kidneys to develop. And if that DNA strand gets well, larger, say due to mutation, but just the sequence itself doesn't code for anything. Right. Let's say, for example, it doesn't contain information for working lungs, heart, et cetera. Then the amount of DNA added, it's useless so, and it would be more of a hindrance than a help. So we would have to see billions of these information gaining mutations. And if we could see that and document that in a way that would falsif falsify my. So model. that's kind of a that's kind of a tall order to pull off, especially since we don't have the. We don't even have fossils of a lot of the protists that existed because of how small they were and things like that. What we do have, though, is, again, what I was saying earlier, is we have amplification and modification of pre-existing pre structures. How and did structures that pre-existing that... structures get so, there? That's my point. Well, here's an example. Uh, here's, really in... can arise. Well, here's an example I wanted to, to give. These What these structures do is they arise from structures that didn't do this other, that didn't do this function originally. Uh, ATP synthase is one example. It arose from a hexamerical uh, helicase uh, protein that did this completely unrelated function but was co-opted because there's loads and loads and loads of, of research on this topic. I did a whole video on it. Um, it was co-opted for this function, this new function that it didn't have, that it wasn't you know, supposed to do. And it ultimately, through a number of successive modifications, became this new structure that didn't previously exist. Um, in the case, in one case, uh, coenoflagellates, which I really like, and I talked about them extensively in uh, Common Ancestry Part 5, I think. Um, these guys have little structures in them, because they're unicellular, but they can aggregate for different functions. Um, they have structures like receptor tyrosine kinases and uh, 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 other parts, like... Uh, I'm drawing a blank right now, but they're these little parts that basically... Wait help cells stick together but they're unicellular okay. these are things that don't need to stick together to, to other cells but these but there are closest they're the closest relatives of the animals and what you see when you get into the animals is these structures cadherins and integrins there you go those are the other ones so cadherins and integrins and receptor tyrosine kinases these things that are in coenoflagellates that are doing totally different jobs because coenoflagellates don't need to stick to any other cells these things are being co-opted for totally different functions, which is used for cell-to-cell -cell recognition and adhesion and signaling. These are to these are new functions that have arisen because of mutations and natural selection. It, but so, it, it, it sounds like you tried to, you know, 
not use the words this time. Um, you know, I'm adaptations. Not, no, it is uh, adaptation. It, it, it probably not, is. It, well, it would it, have to be adaptation, but adaptation is a part of natural selection. Adaptation isn't. I mean, that that's. But obviously natural universe. selection is the selection. Pro well, I'll look into these different things because at the end of the day, you know, we looked at the lizard one. Normally the ones that people bring up, you know, sickle cell anemia, I didn't bring it up, digestion by bacteria. You didn't bring those up, which is good. I didn't, well, I didn't need to because I see, I know what creationists think about them and I know what's wrong with bringing up those examples and there are better examples to bring up. With well, the example of sickle cell anemia, that's an example of a heterozygotic advantage. Well, there are examples of mutations in humans that don't involve heterozygotic advantage. The apolipoprotein A1 example is one of them. No one's it, to it's not to anyone's detriment to be a carrier for apolipoprotein A1 uh, or to express it fully. Uh, so, you know, detriment there. Uh, in the example of the the aerobic uh, or the aerobic respiration, and the citrate, and the E. coli, the Richard Lenski research. I've done I've done a bit of reading on that. There's some papers by like uh, Minick. Uh, that talk about how it's really not that surprising that they develop the ability to metabolize citrate because they can do it or it, metabolize citrate in an, an anaerobic environment, I think is what it yeah, is. Yeah, so, so they're, they're losing the control of the normal anaerobic citrate digestion. And then that way, whether the sort genes of. are on or off, it's still well, based on that pre-existing variation. So, but um, but see, I didn't use any of those examples because I know of better examples because I've studied yeah, no. the data and, and I'm constantly it, reading technical literature. And, and, and if I'm going to be honest with my, with, um, with myself, because even the lizard one, that's another one. And obviously I use that and I feel like I sufficiently refuted that. as new. So I'll know. look at these. It's I'll, a good I'll, example. At, sure, but I'll look at these certain ones that you, because obviously I don't know every single example that there is. Well, I don't know every single example that there <laughs> is. I mean, uh, <laughs> obviously yeah. I'm glad you brought up, you know, a, a few decent ones I can go look up and see, hey, you know, this looks like it is. Uh, you know, an example of, of novel information, because at the end of the day, this will be the last thing I say. And you can say one last thing because we can do this again. But yeah, because according to the biblical perspective, yeah, I like you, I, I'll tell you, I'll have you, you back on. I like you. <laughs> yeah, I think I think we had fun. I think we had a couple laughs with the pine trees and elephants, but <laughs> <laughs> pin elephants. Um, I think it's on a T-shirt now. So <laughs> and, and I like going up, you know, I like having discussions with you that are going to bring up these new examples or, you know, bring up a new um you know, a, a little bit more of a challenge because then I can go look at these afterwards because technically what I'm saying, you know, with my model is the change within living, living things. It doesn't require the new information to be added to the genome, right? Because we expect the loss of genetic information. So I believe, obviously, whether we agree or not, I believe the overwhelming amount of mutations and changes we see, they can be categorized in, say, loss of information, loss of function. That's consistent with my model. And yes, mm -hmm. if you can prove that, you know, we're seeing uh, many, many numerous of these, you know, information adding uh, mutations and obviously natural selection adding on that, uh, you know, that would prove that, hey, listen, these processes, they can actually write the genetic script. Therefore, we don't need the designer to write the genetic script. All I'm saying is God wrote the genetic script. We're now seeing variation based on genetic script. So I'm going to look at these, these examples you said as well, if you can send them to me. Uh, that's pretty much all I have to say. If you want to, I'll try to put them in the link in the link or the description down at the bottom. I'll try to remember what I've said because I actually I should probably write it down right now so I don't forget. I'll try. Is this gonna is this gonna go on right away? I'd I'd like to probably listen to it tomorrow. Oh, uh, yeah. I think these things all go up automatically on YouTube. I think that's yeah, just the way to I, do it. And then I can it, I'll put it on my channel and I'll put a link to your original. Uh, I'm sure you'll be getting lots more reviews on yours, but yeah, I'll, I'll put it on my channel and hopefully we can have a secondary discussion. Um, I'll look up a few more of the examples you've said and maybe we can kind of go back and forth on those as well. It'll be fun. Okay. Um, I guess to finish off, I'm still really not sure what you mean when you say information. Um, I think there's kind of been a bit of, I don't know, maybe I wasn't, uh, comprehending what you were saying or something. Maybe, maybe it might be entirely my fault. But I have provided examples of new structures, new functions, uh, non-coding sequences that became coding. Uh, we see, for instance, organisms adapting. I have no problem with that word. It's a perfectly fine word. Um, adapting to environments. Natural no, selection is shaping. No, I, I agree. It's a good word. Um, I'm not like a pan-adaptationist. I mean, it's not it's not like everything is adapting, you know, genetic drift is most certainly a factor in things and stuff like that. Um, but, uh, but 
all evolution requires is changes in the in the alleles in the existing genetics the pre-existing <laughs> gene and you keep and saying pre-existing right and you just and, because we have to it, it's nonsensical <laughs> to say a non-pre-existing okay how something non-pre-existing well, it's nonsensical. everything you're saying these examples would you say that that's sufficient to explain the four-dimensional genome with overlapping codes and chock full of information Wait, i mean the, the what the four-dimensional genome Oh, we're seeing e even one sentence of these nucleotides, they have overlapping meanings. I mean, there's so much information packed I'm, in your genome. I'm not going to touch that at the moment because I fear that will take us down a rabbit hole. The point I'm trying to make touch is... That next. Okay, we can touch that next. That'll be a good topic. Um, the point I'm trying to make is all evolution requires is modification, amplification, whatever, of, of structures that already exist, whether it's an arm turning into a wing, whether it's uh, beta keratins turning into feathers, receptor tyrosine kinases being modified uh, to have cell to cell signaling. Uh, these are all perfectly well understood and explained within evolution. This is what precisely what we expect to go on in evolution and it allows us to make m a model that has predictability. Um, for instance, next time perhaps we can talk about uh, chromosome 2 because I did a whole video on that. And it's very interesting. Actually, uh, I, did, I did watch that video. So I, I thought maybe we would touch on that. So that is a good thing. So maybe those few things we could touch on next time. Because I was okay. kind of, because obviously that's a, that's a bigger evidence. But yeah, let's let's touch on that one next time. Um. So yeah, it's, we don't expect new structures to just pop into existence. There has to be a genetic basis for it. All phenotype, everything phenotypic is based in genetics. And so what we would expect is the modification of the genes. That's it. We just expect that. And as you said, evolution is changing allele frequencies in the population over generations. The, the alleles, you know, organisms are born with variation, which can be caused by, you know, uh, uh, unequal crossing over, uh, Mendelian inheritance, mutations, all these things that are coming into, coming into play to shape organisms. And that's all evolution requires. It doesn't require anything really, you know, mysterious or or weird. I mean, you know, some things of evolution are really weird, but uh, it doesn't ultimately, I think, fundamentally require anything weird other than organisms having variations that are inherited and that are uh, changed through a mechanism of evolution, whether it be natural selection or genetic drift or whatever. That's I mean, really, all all it requires, that's the entirety of it, the sum, the start and the finish. That's really get, it. It is kind of weird that, you know, pine trees and elephants are related because they're both eukaryotes, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> and they are. And there's a, you know, it's it makes sense because changes, uh, changes are inherited. Sure. Uh, the first person who had apple light or protein A1 mutation, which is a guy, it's been tracked to a guy in the early 1900s, I think. Um, he passed that on to his family or to his progeny who passed it on to their progeny, who passed it on to their progeny. So we can see in real time examples of a mutation or something and variation being passed on. So we know, we know through, uh, that's what paternity tests are for. We know that these things are passed down and, and inherited. Traits are inherited and traits can be modified. And that's, that's really it. That's all evolution is it's just about you know, modification of your of your traits and so and it allows us to make predictions and that's why it's such a good model that's why it's the only model currently uh of that is overwhelmingly accepted by by researchers is because it allows us to make predictions and it is falsifiable and it fits with the data Awesome. Um, Jackson, thanks for having me on. Um, you know what? Maybe next time we can touch um, even on some of the, the uh, global flood, Noah's Ark type stuff. We'll go into chromosome two. We'll, ha we'll have some fun. I had a good conversation, Jackson, um, and have a good night, man. I'll, I'll rewatch this tomorrow and hopefully we'll have some more points to consider next time. Okay. And uh, anything that like you want me to add in the, um, in the description or any more links you want me to send you something like that. I'm happy to do that. Of course, I'd, 
because I'm sure I'll forget. I'm certain I will forget of something. I'll, so. I'll definitely, I'm definitely going to upload it and rewatch it tomorrow so I can get some of those examples that I, I haven't. Because obviously, if I don't know the details of them, I'm not going to be able to say, hey, was this a loss of this, loss of that, or whatever. Yeah, that, no, go, go read the, the those. But I, go get on Google Scholar, look up any of this stuff. Yeah, you know, that's, that's in the description, you can just put, um, I, I think we kind of talked about models, whether it's limits or whatever, but you know what, you, uh, you do what you got to do and, um, have a good night, man. We'll, we'll talk to you soon. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you everybody in the chat for showing up and we are powering down. Have a good night, everybody. Cause it's early in the morning for me. So good night, everybody. <laughs> Bye. Good.